Welcome to the Swim Swam podcast. I'm your host, Coleman Hodges. Joining me today, Anastasia Pagonis from the Olympic Training Center. Is that right? Yes, it's amazing here. <laughs> just moved out to Colorado Springs to become a resident athlete uh, there for the Paralympian team. How long have you been out there now? I've only been out here for one week, so it is very new to me, but everyone is so nice, and I'm getting the area down pretty well, and I'm just so happy able to t- swim and train here, which is amazing. <laughs> that uh, That is such a cool opportunity um, for someone, how, and how old are you? I'm 16 especially for someone of your age that 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 seems like a very very cool and unique opportunity i'm so thankful to be here not a lot of people get the opportunity to be able to swim even at all right now and i could do it in one of the best places (laughs) it's it sounds pretty nice um so for anyone out there and honestly myself included who who doesn't who isn't super familiar with your story um Could you describe what classification in para-swim you are and and what that means to the audience? Yeah, so Paralympics is a bunch of classifications, so they try and make it as even as possible so that you're racing against people who are pretty much your level. So S1 to S10 is all physical, so that would be like amputees or people with cerebral palsy, things like that. Mm -hmm. And then S11 to S13 is visual. So S11 is completely blind or you have light perception. And then S12 is a little bit better. And then S13, you're visually impaired. And then S14 is cognitive. So I'm in the S11 category. And S11s all have to wear blackout goggles because some of us have light perception and some of us don't. So to make it even, we're in blackout goggles. (laughs) Okay, that's intense. Uh, Gotcha. And so, so... Uh, so you can perceive light. That's correct. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay. And I mean, so, so let let's let's start with let's start with the the beginning of your story. You you were born being able to see like like many others. Is that correct? Yeah, I was fully sighted until I was nine. Okay. And uh, can you describe you know what what that process was like of kind of losing your vision? Yeah, so when I was nine, I was having trouble seeing small fonts and like reading things and the chart at school and things like that. Mm -hmm. So my parents took me to a doctor and the doctor was so nasty. He was like, you just have ADD and you're not paying attention. I'm like, oh, I think you're wrong. So my parents took me to a specialist and I got a bunch of genetic testing done. And I came back with a genetic disease that is pretty much attacking my retina. Mm -hmm. And then when I was 11, my vision went to 2400, which doctors said my vision wouldn't get any worse than that. So I was pretty happy there. I wasn't able to drive, obviously, and I couldn't read things, but and things like that. And then in 2018, when I was 14, my vision completely blew. Um, all the color and the smear that I had just turned black and it was just, it was a really scary time for me and my family. We went back to my retina specialist and we got a lot more testing done. I remember being there for like 13 hours one day. I was like, oh, yeah, brutal. <laughs> but day. I came back with autoimmune retinopathies, which is pretty much my immune system is attacking my retina because it thinks that it's bad, mm-hmm. which it's not, but you know, yeah. <laughs> and then another genetic disease. Wow. Um, So when you were 11 uh, and your vision was at 2400, like, did you just, you know, wear really strong glasses and you could see normally? So the thing with, (laughs) I get that a lot. I get that question, like, why don't you just wear glasses and things like that? But since it's not the lens of my eye, it's my actual retina that's like 
pretty much getting eaten alive. Okay. <laughs> so there's nothing to fix it or no cure or anything. I could blow things up. So like if I was reading on my phone, I could like make the text larger and it would be easier for me to see. But like wearing glasses and things like that wouldn't help. I see. Gotcha. <laughs> um, I mean, as as a as a fourteen year old and and literally having um, your you know your world go dark. Uh, yeah. I mean, how mentally, emotionally, how how did you get through that period? Um, it was a lot of like outpatient therapy and things like that. I, I didn't want to do anything. I stopped swimming at that time. So I thought that if I was a swim, if I wasn't a swimmer, then I wasn't anything and that I was worthless. And that if I was blind, then what was the point of me even living anymore? I just felt completely hopeless and worthless. And that I was just being just a pain for everyone. And that's what I felt. And I went through a lot of depression and anxiety. And I was able to pull through it. But it was definitely a hard time for me and my family. I'm so thankful for my parents. They would push me to get out of the house and just go for walks and things like that because I just wanted to stay in my bed and sleep and cry all day. I wasn't eating. I didn't eat for months. It just like, it made me nauseous just like thinking about that because my whole life was just flipped upside down. I, I couldn't, I couldn't imagine any other response. Um, <laughs> yeah. you, know, you know, that, that sounds really terrifying and that sounds like a really hard thing to cope with. And, um, you know, as you said, I think, I think many, most, if not all swimmers can relate to, well, if I don't have swim, what do I have? Exactly. Um, and so a lot that's of are like that. They just think that if they don't have their sport, then they're a nobody. Like I'm a swimmer. That's what I just put myself as, not as I'm Anastasia Pagonis, which I am. I'm not a swimmer, but I'm Anastasia, Anastasia Pagonis, who is a swimmer. <laughs> exactly. And, uh, you know, it seems like a very, that seems like a good lesson to learn young, but obviously that's a, that's a hard, that's a hard thing to, to get the picture of, um, for sure. Yeah. <laughs> that takes us to your other story in aquatics, which, um, Let's, let's get that down. When did you start swimming? Uh, so I was a soccer player, and then I got kicked okay. in the face by the ball too much. <laughs> so my doctor was like, let's try a less contact sport, and he recommended swimming. So I was like, eh, but I got in, and I tried it, and right when I went into the pool, I felt such a connection with it. My dad taught me how to swim, like, ever since I was little. So I was always at the beach and things like that, but I never was on, like, a competitive swim team. Mm -hmm. So right when I got in the water, I was able to see the wall and things like that. It was blurry, but I was able to see it. So I was able to like flip and do all the normal things. And it was just a place that I felt free. And then once I lost my vision, um, I was on an abusive team. So they just were not helpful with me at all. So I stopped swimming because things had happened on that team. And I just thought that swimming wasn't the thing for me. And then... I got back into the pool, and that was horrible. <laughs> right when I jumped in the pool, I smashed right into the lane line. I was like, oh, uh, this is going to be interesting. <laughs> so nobody wanted to coach the blind girl. Nobody had faith in me, which was tough. But I was able to find a coach probably like eight months later who just took me on, and his whole team took me on, Mark Dan and then Islanders Aquatics. I mean – Honestly, the best team that I've ever worked with. I've been, I've been to teams all over the country pretty much, and he is the best man. He is an amazing coach, and honestly, he just like we had this bond with each other right when we met, and I think that was amazing. He blacked out his goggles for me to try and see how I would swim and how he could teach me how to swim all over again. Wow. So, sir, I mean, <laughs> that's, that's awesome. Certainly dedication to the craft. Uh, oh, yeah. <laughs> And it is, so are you, Islander Aquatics, is that in New York? Yes. Okay. Suffolk County, yeah. Gotcha. Okay. Um, so you, so you had a long, a long history in swimming um, before you lost your vision. Uh, I had a similar experience with soccer of getting kicked in the face too many times, <laughs> balls. Um, <Yes>. I, <laughs> I understand that 100%. Um, so, so you, you get in, so 
after you lose your vision, um, how, how long was it before you finally got in the pool again and unfortunately um, collided with the lane line? Probably about 10 months. I was just okay. working on mental health. I was in a dark place for about eight months yeah. and just trying to get out of that. And my dad kind of was like, you're not swimming. And he told me that because it was making me feel so stressful. So I'm glad he did that. Um, but then I felt like it was something that I wanted to do because I remembered how much I just loved it and how free I felt when I was in the water. So I wanted to figure it out again and see if I could do it. And Paralympics is just amazing. Like seeing all of these people who have disabilities getting through it. Like even if you can't go to an actual Paralympic meet or be a part of it, just watching it is literally mind blowing how amazing these athletes are. <laughs> yeah. So, so tell me about get, cut, going into that Paralympic community. What was your first experience at a meet like? Yeah. So I was pretty sighted. I was an S13. So I was able to see just everything besides like details, I guess. So mm -hmm. the first one that I went to just seeing all of these like elite athletes like literally elite athletes that are all racing I mean they were in like Rio and all of that and it's just amazing that I'm around these people and they all have disabilities and how they fought through it and that they're doing what they love to do and that just gave me so much drive I was like oh, if they can do it then I can do it and I just felt so determined to do it and then when I lost my vision that kind of my love for swimming kind of faded until I found my other coach and he just brought that back for me. <laughs> yeah. And so when you finally did come back in the water, um, how long did it take for you to feel, I guess, back, back to where you were before? I will never, I mean, hopefully <laughs> so far, I mean, my times probably will never compare to my sighted times considering that I'm crashing into the lane lines <laughs> and I can't see the wall and things like that. But once I started feeling comfortable in the water, that took about probably about eight weeks. So like two months. Okay. And then I started working on speed. And then six months after I got into the pool, I traveled with Team USA to Australia and I was not expecting to do well. I was just going there to get like classified. But I ended up doing pretty well. I got two golds there, which was amazing. But just all the athletes that you're racing against, they, like, inspire you and you inspire each other. It's amazing. <laughs> I mean, that sounds like a great trip. Uh, what did you get gold? What, what events did you win? What events did you swim? Yeah, my events are the 400 free and the 200 I am. Okay, nice. Uh, <laughs> And what, I mean, did you get to do anything other than swim while you were in Australia? That sounds like a really cool experience. I got to go to a zoo and hold a koala. I was so happy. <laughs> that was definitely one of the favorite parts of that whole trip. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> Gold medals, that's fine. Koala, <laughs> that's what I'm talking koala, about. Koala, <laughs> though, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that sounds great. Um, okay, so, so you mentioned, again, you're wearing blackout goggles can't see it you know whereas maybe you could see again you can see light uh can't see anything when you're in the pool is so or is crashing into lane lines you know maybe hitting the wall every once in a while is that just like par for the course oh yeah you're like prepared for that if you're an s11 and like you just no, okay i'm going to be hitting the lane line anytime soon and then the wall i have well, at the Olympic Training Center, they're very set up for blind people. So I have sprinklers that pretty much like sprinkle where the flags are, and that's when I know. And then okay. I take four strokes, and then I flip. Okay. But back at home or like when I'm in a meet, I get tapped. So it's pretty much a long metal pole that has a pool noodle on the end of it, and someone just like whacks me with it. <laughs> and then I know when to flip. So it's just kind of – I use the lane line as a guide pretty much. So instead of just – going for it in the middle because I know I'm going to gear off and then I'm going to smash and it's going to be worse. I sure. kind of hug the lane line and every three strokes, I'll just like tap it with my fingers okay. just to know that I'm like kind of in line. Yeah, definitely. But like all S11s have like different places they want to be tapped and different methods on staying straight. So it all just depends. Interesting. Uh, mm -hmm. And so like, you said you, your events are the 400 free, the 200 IM. Yeah. Is, 
I mean, obviously that's not like the 50, but you know, uh, when you're racing, you want to go as fast as you can is, are you still going as fast as you can, even though there's that sense of, Oh, well, I might, I'm going to hit the lane line at some point. <laughs> yeah, I just go for it. Luckily, I'm very thankful. I'm, I'm typically not a person to have a lot of fear about like injuries and things like that. I did okay. smash the concrete wall one time. It was very painful, but I'm still alive. So I'm like, hey, if I do it again, it's not that big of a deal. <laughs> So I kind of just go for it and you have to have a lot of trust in your tappers. And oh. then usually when I'm doing like a 400, I'm going obviously like fast, but I'm going like a strong, not more like a sprint, like a 50 or a hundred. Mm -hmm. So usually when I'm doing a 50 and a hundred, if I crash one time, that's three seconds right there. And then that screws up the entire race. So if it's a 400 and I crash two or three times, I have enough time to make up for it. So that's why I'm not really a sprinter. <laughs> that makes total sense. <laughs> um, I mean, do you have, <laughs> I know I had a scar on my hands for the, for the longest time because uh, I hit the lane line. I hit my hand with on the lane line so many times. Oh yeah. Not in blackout goggles. Right? Oh yeah, my scars all over my hands. My cuticles are like all bloody. Okay. Okay. <laughs> oh yeah. We just, <laughs> just gotta embrace it though, so it's fine. <laughs> just making sure, but it makes total sense. And obviously, what else can you do besides embrace it? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, well, that's man. That sounds intense, but that that sounds really cool that you are able to still swim and still swim at a very high level. Thank you. <laughs> Definitely. And so, uh, again, like I said before we started recording, um, I did watch your episode of George to the Rescue, um, where yeah. you got you got a pretty big renovation. Can you tell us about that experience? Yeah. So George to the Rescue, um, they came to my house and they redid a bunch of rooms in my house and they pretty much made my house accessible for me. If I was too hot in my house, I had no way of turning the air on and things like that because it was all visual. So now when I go in my house, I could be like, Alexa, do this and Alexa, do that. So they made everything like super technology and like it's all crazy. It's literally insane. My house is awesome now. <laughs> and, then, and my room is like, all textures it's insane like my floor i'd rather sleep on my floor than my bed it's crazy really <laughs> and they gave me an endless pool in my garage so thank you to endless pools for that it was amazing they donated that pool to me and during covid that was obviously like such a blessing to have that it's amazing i'm so thankful for everything they did for me <laughs> Uh, that that sounds really cool. Obviously, an endless pool during COVID is like, yeah, oh, yeah. Uh, diamond in the rough, canary in a coal mine situation. Literally, That's literally. <laughs> um, and so, okay, hold on. Tell me about your room a little more. Your your floor. You'd rather sleep on your floor. What? Tell me about these textures because uh, they sound the awesome. Floor is literally like a giant teddy bear, like as a floor like my carpet is literally a teddy bear it's amazing <laughs> and then I have like my whole like vanity but like it's not an actual vanity because it doesn't have a mirror it has like a pin board because like I don't need a mirror obviously but um and it just has such a like warm environment kind of feeling and then like the lights are like cove lights that's what they're called okay and they're pretty much inside my wall but like not I don't know how to explain it because my eyes are very light sensitive, but if okay. someone needs to come in my room and turn the lights on, they made it so that it doesn't hurt my eyes, but they're still light. It's really cool. Okay. Nice. Yeah. They did an awesome, like insane job. <laughs> that sounds really cool. And then you also got to meet an idol of yours, Molly Burke. Oh, I love Molly. Yeah. Every time she comes to New York, we always hang out with each other. She's amazing. She is definitely the only person that really pulled me through. Like, I don't know, all my therapists and doctors and things like that, they would try and help me, but I didn't want to talk to them or anything because I was like, 
what do you have to say? You've never been through anything. You have no idea what I'm going through. How can you even compare with me? And I just kind of felt that and I just didn't want to talk to them and things like that. So Molly was definitely someone that I could just compare with and we could talk about things with. And she just made me feel like I had hope and that I could get through it. Yeah. Did, uh, can you tell me a little bit about the time you spent with her and, and maybe how, how she did help you get through some of that? Yeah, she um, spending time with her was amazing. We were just talking and laughing the whole time. But just things like her YouTube videos, I felt like I wasn't alone. How she was saying that she was suicidal and that she just felt like she was hopeless and worthless. I felt like, oh my God, like this girl is still here. Look how much of a badass she is. <laughs> like, why can't I be like that? And it just gave me hope that I was going to get through it. And I definitely needed it at that time. And someone who's been through pretty much the exact same thing as me at the same time as me. Yeah. And so obviously she's inspired you in more ways than one. You've, you've got a pretty big social media following yourself now. Um, yeah. T- tell me about how, how your social media brand has kind of built and, and what you've done to build it. Yeah, social media was kind of like my outlet, I guess. So um, I just love like, I just want to inspire people. And I feel like blindness has such a stereotype where you have to look a certain way and they put you in this box where you can't do anything. You have to stay in this little box. And I just want to show people that like, I'm out of this box. I'm going to be an elite athlete and hoping to go to Tokyo and things like that. And just showing people that people with disabilities can do do anything. I mean, I can't drive, but like still, (laughs) Um, and just inspiring people and telling them my story and just little snippets into my life and things like that. I feel like people are very ignorant with blindness. <laughs> and I mean, you know, I I will admit, I myself do not know a lot about blindness. Um, and yeah. just just the little bit of looking at your social media, um, your your YouTube is really funny, but also super informative because you you are pretty candid about the fact that you're blind and not a lot of people know about what a blind person goes through on a day-to-day basis. Yeah. Not a lot of people understand. They think like, Oh, you just take your cane out and you're good. But like, okay, how do you know where to go when you have your cane? How do you know if there's a door in front of you? How do you know which direction the store is in? Like even when you wake up in the morning, you have to put your toothpaste on your finger before you put it on your toothbrush. So you know how much is going on. Just, little things that people don't understand. And I get a lot of hate because I don't quote unquote look blind or whatever that's supposed to mean. So people are definitely very ignorant. (laughs) Yeah. Um, And, but again, I I really appreciate how, how educational and how, um, how informative your videos are. Let's, uh, if you want to follow Anastasia, it's at Anastasia underscore K underscore P on Instagram. And uh, YouTube channel, and Love, is that correct? Uh, no, it's the same name. All of okay. my social medias are under the same thing. YouTube, Anastasia underscore K underscore P. Uh, yes. So what, what has been your favorite part about connecting with so many people on these social media platforms? I just love that when people DM me that they're getting bullied or that they're losing their vision, that I'm able to help them and get them through that because I don't want them to get stuck in the place that I was in and I know how they feel and just getting stuck there would just, oh my God. I know a lot of people who are still stuck in that, like angry at themselves, angry at God, angry, why did this happen to me and things like that. And just getting out of that and moving on and accepting okay, I'm blind. Let's make the best of my life now. And just doing that and people DMing me that they're getting bullied and things like that. I just want to help them. (laughs) Yeah. And I mean, it seems like you've done, done a pretty good job so far. Uh, (laughs) Absolutely. What, and so you've gone through a really big transition of moving to Colorado Springs. Um, Do you know how long you're going to be there? Um, At least until Tokyo. So yeah it's the best place for me to train as of right now um 
I mean, the coaches are amazing. It's a long course pool, which is really awesome. The whole facility is super accessible for me, which is amazing. My dog, my guide dog can get it down super fast, which is good. And they do everything so safe during COVID. They quarantine you for at least seven days and they give you COVID testing every single day and all of this stuff. So they make sure it's super safe, which is good. <laughs> that, that definitely seems like a positive. It seems like they're doing their due diligence, which is awesome. Yeah. Um, so, so as a 16 year old, you know, you're going to be away from your parents away from, I'm guessing a lot of your, your friends and family back in New York. Um, mm-hmm. What, what went into this decision for you? And, and so far, how has that transition been? Um, like, I don't know. <laughs> I'm happy to be here. I think that Tokyo is my goal. And I just want to prove to people that I can do it and that I'm going to do anything to get there. Because it's a dream of mine to go to the Paralympics and things like that. So I think that being here is definitely one step closer, for sure. <laughs> yeah. Do, you know, as, as someone who is visually impaired, it was the transition from going to, you know, being at your house a lot, again, where, where it is very easy for you to get around and accessible, um, to being now at the OTC, has that transition been fairly smooth? Oh, um, it's been interesting. Definitely, if I didn't have my guide dog, I would not be here right now. I, if I was just using my cane and things like that, I would not be able to do it. So I am so thankful for my guide dog. He's my eyes. I mean, he gets me around everywhere. He, they are so smart. It's literally insane. (laughs) Uh, And let's tell me about your guide dog, Radar. Is that correct? Yeah. He's the best. He's actually um, the NHL Islanders puppy. So they gave me him, and he is amazing. Him. He's literally the most smart dog in the entire world. Like, it's crazy. But I'm taking him from the ice to the pool. So a little bit of a transition, but. <laughs> uh, yeah, I thought that was pretty, pretty sweet that, that, that a hockey team gave you their dog. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I, and that was really that was pretty recent right yeah that was about two weeks ago so this all everything happened so fast moving out here and getting radar and all that stuff but if it wasn't for radar i would not be able to be here right now he's my best friend he's my partner in crime (laughs) yeah He, he seems like a really a very cool dog obviously very smart uh when when did you when was the decision made that you were moving to the OTC? The decision to move to the OTC was, I think, like three weeks before I came here, which okay. is crazy. Yeah. It was everything happened so fast. Me and my mom were like, okay, now we have to get all of this stuff. Amazon was coming like every single day. It was <laughs> crazy, but I'm here now and everything's like calm and I'm kind of getting back into the pool. I feel super heavy in the water, which kind of sucks, but... I know that I'll get better. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, so present day, what, what is, what does a training session for you look like on any given day? Yeah. So pretty much a day in training would be, uh, seven to 9 AM. I have my practice and then I have it again, depending on the time. So we're doing off campus and on campus cause there's some athletes that do live off campus and they have to do it at different times. <laughs> So for me, it would be seven to nine and then three to five. And then I also do weights on Tuesdays and Thursdays in between. Whew. That's a, yeah, that's a busy schedule. <laughs> the and, walk of fun. <laughs> worth it, so, though. Worth it. Uh, again, you, you said you swim 400 free, 200 IM. Uh, what, what's one of your favorite training sets that you've done in, in the past week since you've been there? Hmm. I've actually only been in the pool three times because I was okay. quarantined. <laughs> gotcha. That makes sense. Uh, my, favorite, my favorite type of set is definitely like a distance set. I love distance, but Paralympics doesn't have distance mm-hmm. in their thing. So they only have 400. That's the most distance for my classification. Gotcha. But like distance set. Oh my God. I love it. <laughs> nice. Uh, so, so moving forward, into the next 
couple couple weeks, couple months, um, you know, yeah. again, you're you're settling in at the OTC. What are you looking forward to? What do you have any goals in the short term? Um, in the short term. So there's different kind of like national teams for Paralympics. There's national, there's emerging national C, national B, and national A. So when I was in Australia, I missed national A by 0 0.03 because of course that's my puck. <laughs> Um, yeah. so my goal is definitely to work my butt off to get to that national a cut, <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, that, and, and when, when would you, uh, swim to try to attain that national a cut thing that like kind of sucks is that like, since COVID everything has been canceled for 2020. Yeah. So I'm hoping in the beginning of 2021, there'll be some sort of world series that I can go to, which would be awesome. <laughs> yeah. Gotcha. Um, well, Anastasia, do you have any closing thoughts before uh, before we head out here? I think I'm good. <laughs> okay. Well, thank you so much for taking the time to to talk to me and share a little bit of your story. Um, again, a lot of educate, very educational for me and hopefully for our audience as well. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. I'm so excited to like be on this. <laughs>